So, uh, hello everyone. My name is um, Anya Jokic and I will moderate um, today's um, panel discussion. This is the third panel discussion in the series of panel discussions titled Post-COVID or Post-Democracy Balkans. And this series provide young people from the region a platform to cover and discuss issues, discuss issues of uh, political instability, human rights, freedom of media and challenges of um, civil society as well as young people. This is uh, this series conducted uh, within a framework of Initiative Young Generation for Western Balkans 2030, which is run by International Institute for Peace in collaboration with Austrian Institute uh, for International Affairs and um, Karl Renner Institute. Uh, topic of today's panel discussion is uh, solidarity within the region and beyond. And uh, we will discuss, as I said, a little bit more uh, about solidarity. In the past, we have witnessed an uh, increase of solidarity in the region during the times of crisis, such as floods in Serbia several years ago, and also uh, earthquakes in um, Albania recently. But during this global crisis, it seems that Western Balkan has been disconnected and um, has been governments have been turned more towards uh, their respective national situations during the crisis. Today with us we have Adnan Charimagic, Dafina Peci, and Samir uh, Beharic, and they will tell us a little bit more about international cooperation, actually interregional cooperation, and how it has been affected by the uh, COVID-19, and was it for better and or for worse? And also they will kind of uh, let us know how can we pass by this going back to normal and what are the lessons learned of the current situation and how the situation can be translated into actions towards positive change with young people as actors of, uh, and uh, agents of positive change. So um, firstly, today we have Adnan Charimagic, who is analyst at European Stability Initiative, which is a think tank based in Berlin. And he is also a member of IIP um, Advisory Board. And today he will actually greet us from Bosnia and Herzegovina. As I have mentioned, this is the third uh, event in the series. So he will uh, brief us on the on the first two discussion and give us an overview of key points. Um, but also we, he will tell us a little bit more about how can, how can we transform a bit of a negative uh, emotions into realization of this bright um, vision and hopeful vision we have. And also he will share some thoughts on European Union and Western Balkans um, relation in current, current stage of pandemic. So, uh, then please. Well, Anya, thank you very much, and and thank you for 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 setting up uh, the event and opportunity uh, to speak. Um, I have been I have moderated the first panel, and I watched very close closely the second the second discussion. This is the third one, and there will be uh, a couple of more. But what I think what was also the title of of our series of panels was was uh, somehow linked to the anger that uh, most of us who are from the Western Balkans or who are watching, observing Western Balkans have felt at least through social media and through media reports from, from the region. Initially in March, we were very angry about the reaction of our authorities and governments. We, we felt that they were mismanaging the health crisis uh, and the danger that it uh, has posed to our societies. Then in uh, many of our countries, it has transformed into a anger towards uh, how uh, the authorities and individuals in our uh, in authorities have used the crisis to for for basically continuing something that that most people felt earlier be it uh, corruption cases be it uh, a public procurement uh, that would benefit individuals uh, or be it uh, other other forms of 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 I would say uh, uh, mis mismanagement. So there was a lot of anger both on social media and in some of the countries. It, it transformed even into a pro into pro different protests against different aspects of, of of authorities and their handling of of different of different uh, crisis. 
and it seems that now in mid June uh, we are uh, we are basically going back to where we were uh, before in a sense that there is a sort of an acceptance of the mismanagement there there is a that there is a that there are other things that people that people trub- that people are troubled with with their individual uh, individual uh, concerns and that uh, uh, somehow I, at least that is how I feel that we are again uh, missing the chance uh, to push uh, a different vision a different a different narrative on the region and uh, and in the uh, in the region uh, when we wrote the paper that we wrote as part of this initiative and published in December last year we based uh, the description of young people in the region on the Friedrich Ebert Foundation's uh, youth study, in, which has shown that our generation of young people is mostly optimistic, mobile, and uh, well connected, that is more concerned about the economy, and quality of education, and environment, and about the uh, fears for national identity or looming war or security uh, instability. Uh, and that on that basis, we've, we've provided um, uh, we provided concrete proposals of how to to transform these hopes and fears uh, into something that could lead towards what Western Balkans being uh, more European, more liberal, uh, more prosperous by by 2030. And I think what what I've learned, and I think what what uh, what I've gained from from the previous panels is that we desperately need. Uh, politicians and political forces in our country, countries and in our society uh, that will champion this vision. So us as young people, being members of civil society, being think tankers, researchers, uh, provide a good basis for rethinking public policies, for rethinking what is wrong in our societies, for putting a, uh, a light on these negative things, for putting uh, the light or energy on things that could improve and that could be better. But uh, at the same time, my sense is that that we're missing a politicians and political forces in many of our countries that are willing, that are able, and that are pushing uh, the, the agenda that is more positive, that is more uh, focused on issues that uh, our generation uh, cares uh, more, more about. So what I think that comes out from from this uh, from from the series of the discussions that we have and what is to a certain extent a lesson for 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 our initiative is how do we link uh, all our ideas with with uh, with politic with political forces that can that can that can take uh, the battle because what we have seen in the past three months is actually thanks to part of the free media thanks to part of the civil society that has that was not tired by 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 the pandemic and that has has been asking questions that has been reporting about corruption cases that has been reporting about cases of mismanagement by health systems etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, that 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 basically this this part of society and this part of energy uh, exists uh, and that we need to that we need to find find a way how to how to better connect it how to better Better put it at the, at the display, and how to how to how to turn it into something that 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 is then capable of delivering uh, more concrete uh, uh, changes. So what we have seen in the past three months is that the political battle in our countries is extremely extremely uh, not violent in a sense of physical violence, but in a sense of how the politics is done in our countries. We've seen the rudest of the rudest uh, in our political systems. And I think that is a lesson for us in, in, of us, for us in, in this initiative, but also for, 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 for young people that uh, in order for, for the change to come, we will need to have individuals and people and politicians that will be willing to go into, into the battle and who will be able to, to fight and deliver uh, the victory for for the vision that that uh, that we have also presented presented in our paper. So I think that the task for for our initiative and and for for us going further will be to think of ways how to connect uh, those those things, how to connect 
people in the institutions that are working hard and that are working doing good work, how to energize them even further, how to spread their energy uh, further, to think about, uh, and that doesn't mean I have to stress out that I, we have to go into politics or that we will go to a politics. It means just that those that are in politics and those that want to go to politics uh, need to be better connected, uh, better connected with us and we need to be uh, better connected with them, providing them both with the criticism but also with, with constructive uh, ideas and, and proposals uh, from, from, from our side. So I think that is uh, to a certain extent... Um, to a certain extent, uh, for me, the most the most important lesson that I've gained from from uh, these two two rounds of, of our panels, but also from 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 what was what was happening in our region uh, in the past in the past uh, uh, four months, I must say, and that that is kind of a concluding remark. We have good politicians in our region. We have seen them working and being vocal and and uh, sharing. Uh, some of the concerns and some of the ideas that, that we have. They don't necessarily belong to one or the other political party. They are in different political parties. We have seen a groups of civil society organizations of activists working on the ground, working with the people whose uh, data was being published because they were supposed to be in self-isolation, but then authorities decided that they present danger for the society and that their data should be published to their neighbors, to their uh, to their uh, to their cities, uh, we have seen uh, both politicians and civil society activists going to the constitutional courts across our region and complaining and fighting for, for the rights. We have seen in some of the institutions actually doing their their work in Bosnia, for example, Agency for Privacy Protection has did did it work better than than the one. Uh, in in Montenegro, for example, we have seen free media and journalists reporting about corruption, reporting about the health system mismanaging, and and we have seen uh, other other parts of our society uh, coping and successfully overcoming some of the issues. If you just think about enormous task of organizing education system during the COVID uh, COVID nineteen and and the entire uh, the entire uh, challenge that that has posed for for so I think for 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 us uh, 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 for us it's it's important to take from here uh, from this from now on uh, to take all this uh, positive energy to look at what what has happened in a positive terms and try to 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 put a light on it and and pre- and push it even further uh, and at the same time understand that all the negative trends that we can see in our societies uh, people and us will will have to fight. Uh, more more forcefully uh, against so uh, that uh, and maybe just as a, as, a, as a last point if we talk about the EU Western Balkan relations again we have seen how important politicians are uh, politicians with vision are in order to put us in the uh, perspective with the EU that 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 we want or that we deserve uh, I don't know how many people are aware, but at the beginning of the crisis, EU decided that the protective medical equipment cannot be uh, exported to the Western Balkans or any other uh, any other non-EU uh, member state. And it was a foreign minister of North Macedonia who started his own initiative with other foreign ministers in the region uh, to write a letter to the EU uh, and the European Commission asking not just for the Western Balkans to be exempted from this from this ban but also in that letter they wrote that they want to be part of a of a of a solution and part of a building of europe in the post uh, covid covid uh, times and that is uh, to a certain extent for me uh, the vision that that we vision that we want our politicians to to go with to, to the eu uh, a vision where we are together uh, building the future uh, for 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 all of us. So that will be kind of my 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 summary and then the first intervention. Thanks. Thank you, Adnan. And just before I introduce our uh, second panelist, I would like to remind everyone that this uh, panel discussion is being streamed live on Facebook. And also um, upon this uh, discussion, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can write them down below and we will get back to it. 
So our next uh, panelist is Dafina Pecci, and she is a secretary general of the National Youth Congress of Albania, but also governing board member of Regional Youth Cooperation Officer, um, known as RAICO. So um, she will give us an overview of the uh, situation in Western Balkan 6 and uh, the dynamics and over, overall um, relations with um, European Union, um, but mostly through a civil society perspective and also through youth perspective. And she will also uh, brief us on current situation in Albania. Thank you very much, Anya. And thank you for having me here. Actually, starting from Albania, since I'm speaking from Tirana now, um, Albania has introduced tough lockdown measures to, pre to prevent the spreading of COVID-19. And I would think that it was the first European country which introduced such measures applicable nationwide. But in the, on the other hand, the pandemic um, appeared to serve as a catalyst for several civil society movements across Albania, which I will mention them briefly in order to give a general overview what is happening here during these two, three months. So basically, it started with the Alliance for Protection of the Theatre, a huge debate in Albania. Um, they formed an opposition to the government de um, decision to demolish the building, organized rallies in several cities to collect signatures for a petition to reconstruct the National Theatre as in its original design. This was one of the first, let's say, acts or movements to show that no matter how things are going and no matter how many restrictions we experienced during these months when people here uh, felt that things are going wrong with the way how the policy makers or the leaders are acting they um, they showed their 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 reaction by deeds i would mention as well um several protests organized um against the violence uh, for Roma community in several cities. Uh, they organized as well in three other cities uh, protests to oppose the violence against minors and sexual violence. Civil society groups were also engaged in collecting signatures for organizing the referendum on the uh, electoral system in opposition to the choice of the electoral system by the political parties. So all these things are happening during this time of crisis. Um, another cluster of civic resistance formed around so-called mandatory vaccination. Dozens of activists marched in Tirana in early June to protest against uh, the government plan to um, administer the COVID-19 vaccine through law. So basically the movement was called No Vaxylvania. And um, uh, the idea was that it, 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 it uh, had a huge, let's say, impact, and it's very important to be elaborated, but when it comes to different traditional media channels, it was all these things that I'm mentioning were not, how to say, mainstreamed in the proper way. So as Adi mentioned before, thanks to all other options that we do have uh, via social media, via different channels, via civil society groups, which are active, via grassroots movements, we have the opportunity to show and to communicate what is going on. And I will uh, put some uh, highlight to this communication part because for, for me, in my, in my point of view, it's very important and it's something which needs to be touched and explained in all this, uh, on this, all this situation. And uh, late, the latest uh, movement uh, is coming from the high school students, which have been facing a lot of difficulties uh, in the educational system during this time. And they had to uh, go through the final exams, uh, which somehow um, have play a huge role in their in their future uh, education in university or whatever they choose. And they were completely unsatis unsatisfied with the way uh, how things were handled in the in the educational system during three months with the exams, with the content, with the way how the exams were were um, organized. And in every city of Albania, you have groups of, of young uh, young uh, people, high school students, protesting and uh, trying to uh, find a middle way um, in the communication with the ministries in charge, especially the Ministry of Education, to uh, 
to 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 make sure that their their requests are 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 foreseen. They, I I must mention that they have delivered um, uh, official package of requests uh, regarding the final exams, and they are expecting for a reaction, uh, official reaction from the Ministry of Education. So um, when it comes to um, in overall the relation uh, EU Western Balkans. I think that well, the EU has has increased their presence uh, both economically and politically, maybe as well, even from the reactions that came from different actors. For example, the governments or or, or even some civil society, uh, how to say, um, soft campaigns, if if I might call it like that. That we we catch the moment or uh, live that momentum uh, when we saw a kind of d- uh, distance or a kind of separation in, in, in the attitude towards towards what was going on. I mean, it was obvious, uh, it was understandable, but it, it, it is not, as we felt, it is not fair. It is not a fair way and, of dealing uh, with, with such situations. And I would say that, well, they have allocated, for example, to Albania 4 million euros for immediate support uh, for health in the health sector and 46.7 million euros to support social and economic um, recovery. But what um, what I would like to talk about is um, it's is the way how how all this was communicated. Um, I think that this situation crisis are are that time when you can uh, see or you can understand the handicaps which do really exist. I mean, in these in these times, you really do see where things are not going well, and they are much more obvious than in normal times. But not that they appeared just on that time. The fact that uh, from the European Union side w- was not launched a kind of strategy of communication with Western Balkan countries, both governmental as, uh, part and, and civil society part. It was not uh, thought in a strategic way how to manage these things beyond the 27 uh, mem- me- member countries. It meant a lot for our, um, uh, how to say, uh, for our way of thinking, for our expectations, for our um, for our expectations, <laughs> I don't know how to how to explain it differently. Maybe this 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 thing, uh, very small in the first sight, indicated even the behavior of the governments toward their societies, because in one way or another, we were left alone with each other. So this nationalistic uh, way of thinking uh, coming from a model which is always talking about um, democracy, um, diversity, solidarity. When you see this model coming from this kind of level, then you feel much more free to act as you want, as you wish in your in your own uh, habitat, in your own country. And um, this this period of time uh, caused a lot of confusion, and confusion does not help when things are fragile, when, where democracy is fragile, when um, civil society actors are still not that strong to make a big opponents to what is happening, when our institutions are still weak, when the low implementation is still weak. Confusion does not help, and uh, what we miss. Um, in these kind of times, and I completely get in line with, with um, Adi because, yes, we do have very good politicians, we do have very good professionals working in the field that we are talking about, very good activists, because I mentioned a lot of movements happening only in Albania during these two, three months, and it, it, it is a testimonial that people do act and do think uh, about democracy and about their rights. But what we are missing is a clarity, a clarity coming from different levels, a strategic approach, um, a long-term perspective. A long-term perspective put, being put uh, into systematic deeds. If we would have this on place, we would have not been going through some experiences that we faced during pandemic. So I don't think that pandemic brought new topics to us. It just opened those which were the weakest ones and made them more um, more... Uh, visible. 
So um, we we had the chance as well to talk among, to speak and to talk among ourselves, but even in the previous sessions, different um, uh, different aspects of uh, or sectors of public policy have been um, directly um, uh, attacked by this on, on, during this time, coming from education. Um, employability uh, or uh, let's say labor market uh, has been going through a, a lot of changes in a very short time and people still are not adopted now but even are not prepared for what is coming uh, in the near future because we do not have any guarantee uh, now for now. I mean in Albania we had just today 82 new cases which I mean in report to our um, to our statistics, it's it's something to 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 be worried about. So you you expect things to go to back to a kind of normality and not to to have uh, an increased number of um, of uh, cases and uh, public policies related to social security. So in this momentum, we we are really uh, how to say uh, understanding where our weak points have been during all the time. And what I think we need is to uh, reflect deeply and um, in a, I don't know, in a very well-coordinated way with people working in institutions, with civil society actors, with a kind of donor coordination, which is very important. And uh, keeping as well a systematic relation with the media, because they are playing as well a huge role in the, in the, in the public, um, how to say, public opinion. Uh, to address in a very constructive way what is needed to be done from now on by lessons learned from from this uh, from these three three months and what is important I would say is the fact that I would like to have in the core of the discussion on the core of the opinion those people who have been directly uh, related to the sector and having them uh, putting the, how to say, the first input on what is needed to be improved. For example, if we are talking about educational system, we should find a way to create a consultation platform with all the teachers, with all the people who has been working in local level, national level, with the education. I don't want to have this talk with the minister in charge. I mean, to me, it's not, not that relevant. I want to have the first talks with the people which were attacked in that sector because they are those who can give the best overview and recommendations. Then going to employ to the employment sector with a business community, having them as those which are guiding us for, for lessons uh, learned. Coming back to the social security system, because I think that in, when it comes to social security, we have a lot to discuss, discuss about because we do have handicaps even in the um, legislation or policy level, but even as well in the institutional level. But we know for sure by numbers that the cases of violence, of, um, of criminality are increased. So how this is going to be addressed? I don't want to have figures and analysis coming from the police state. I want to have them from the local communities, from the people which are in charge for social security department in the municipalities. I want to have their overview upon and take their thoughts and their opinions and their narratives to build up let's say, a new, um, um, a new picture of, a big picture of functioning. Because um, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is the moment to, to reflect in order, uh, to, um, in order not to go through the same, uh, to, to the same steps that we have been through. I mean, it, it, took, it, it get us, got us unprepared, in, in first sight, but then uh, on the other hand, it uh, it was pity the fact that for so many things that we could have put in place long before, uh, we we even didn't think about. So take it from now and and uh, and trying to to build to establish some good uh, dialogue within our countries, but then in Western Balkan region towards EU as well, because somehow more or less we have been. Uh, much more um, comparable to each other rather than with uh, with the developed uh, countries part of uh, European Union. So when it comes to Kosovo, to Serbia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, we have 
I would say maybe the statistics do change, but in a way or another, we have been safe, uh, facing the same uh, the same difficulties. And uh, towards European Union, <laughs> more or less, we are in the same in the same page when it comes to their attitude, to their support, uh, to their um, uh, how to say to their solidarity in a way or another. So uh, I think that uh, working back on, on our, our national level should be nothing more than uh, a duty to fix things home, think, fix the things home, and then uh, find a way to approach European Union jointly when it comes to uh, different key messages that should uh, be delivered not only to the governments or to, to policymakers or decision makers, but also to the public opinion, to the societies of, uh, of Western Balkans. Uh, because in the end of the day, uh, when, when uh, societies such as ours uh, do feel that we have a kind of disconnection, it, it's much easier to be part of a narrative, uh, of a nationalistic narrative or whatever it is. I mean, and I wouldn't like to, to mention the, uh, the, the, the word uh, post-democracy because I really hope that we are not facing that. I think we are we are facing uh, a, um, a huge crisis upon it, which must serve us uh, as a big, big lesson learned for for the future. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Dafina. Um, and I think you kind of gave um, when you mentioned the the difficulties that students have faced in Albania. You gave. Um, you paved the way towards our, our next topic and our next guest speaker and panelist, that is Samir um, Baharit, and he is a trainer at European Parliament and uh, board member at the Western Balkans Alumni Association. And I think, kind of, I, I want to mention it. I, I think we can agree that um, one of the biggest perks of European integration, not only within European Union but also for the Western Balkans, is certainly student mobility. Mm -hmm. but during the time of uh, the pan pandemic, uh, it has brought certain difficulties to, to the students, especially the ones who have found themselves mm -hmm. abroad and into, say, a foreign land. So mm -hmm. Samir will give us an overview of solidarity coming from youth and students and through the perspective of Western Balkans and as well European Union. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya, for, the, for this kind introduction and for setting the stage um, for my part of the of, of, of the presentation. Um, it's very interesting when you, um, if we compare and if we try to see an overview of the media landscape and on the current affairs that we can um, listen to every day when it comes to, you know, um, main victims or, you know, biggest casualties, quote unquote, when it comes to um, that, that COVID-19 had impacted. We usually talk about, you know, people on the ground in the Western Balkans. However, um, not so often, and, and that's a kind of a kind of a. It surprised me in a way, and also it, it it's truly shocking that the media have not caught you know on the big chunk of uh, Western Balkans population, young people um, living and studying abroad. So basically, what has happened? Um, the thing is um, that those young people. Um, who do study in the Western Balkans, they do face difficulties in terms that um, they had, their whole um, everyday routine has changed in terms of attending um, lectures, um, going for exams, etc. cetera. Um, however, even bigger, even bigger problem um, are those students from the Western Balkans currently studying abroad. Erasmus Plus program as such, and any other student mobility, as you, as, as, as you, as you um, rightfully um, recognize, Anya, um, is one of a um, lifetime experience in many cases for many students um, coming from the Western Balkans. For many of them, um, studying abroad for a semester is um, often the first time that they um, travel abroad. Uh, for even more of them, it's the first time that they live um, on their own, you know, that they um, manage their own budget, you know, that they uh, spend time in in, in in foreign community, foreign country. Um, and now can you imagine on top of that, they find themselves in, in, in a distant land uh, where maybe they even do not speak the language of the country um, and they find themselves in the middle of a global pandemic where no one knows how to cope with, no one knows what's the next step. 
um, and no one knows um, um, when will when will it end. You know, and suddenly this student dream of going abroad, studying abroad, you know, um, um, turns into a nightmare. So. During the last two or three months, the, the Western Balkans Alumni Association, which is the, the, the first and the only, basically, um, NGO, regional NGO in the Western Balkans that gathers um, students who have studied abroad and decided to either to return to the Western Balkans or, or, and, or who have stayed abroad, and then we are trying to um, keep in touch with them, um, we have been receiving um, constant messages. Um, basically, in some cases, I'm not even. I'm not even. I won't even put it. I won't even put it under quotes. Um, SOS calls um, from young people <clears throat> from the Western Balkans studying abroad, who have said, um, "We literally um, currently at this moment have issues in paying our rent, um, paying for food, uh, because." Keep in mind that we're not here discussing only on Erasmus Plus students. Usually, Erasmus Plus students have their monthly grant, have their um, uh, uh, scholarship. So in that case, at least from this financial perspective, they have been secured. Um, however, the vast majority of students from the Western Balkans who are studying on full-time um, degree programs um, in the EU, and not just in the EU, even beyond the European Union, has found themselves in, in a bad situation. Just as a reminder, according to the student um, associations in Germany, more than 750,000 students in Germany have lost their student jobs. What does that mean? A lot of students um, have uh, financed their studies and their life abroad uh, by working abroad, you know, student student jobs, working like a ten percent, uh, working like twenty percent, fifty percent of the of, of the working time. However, uh, with the arrival of pandemics, um, the they have lost their jobs, um, and the biggest number of the students that we have received these um, calls and um, who are from the Western Balkans are the students studying in Slovenia, um, Austria, Germany, um, USA as well, um, Russia, Turkey. Um, and what we have tried to do is, first of all, we recognize that there is a huge problem, a, a huge dis discrepancy uh, between the institutions who often did not know how many of their citizens are studying abroad. So that was, for example, the case uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. At this moment, if you ask Bosnian authorities how many of your citizens study abroad, um, either as part-time students or, or, or um, as, as full degree students, they won't be able to say it. So what we did was um, we reached out literally as the Western Balkans Alumni Association uh, to foreign um, ministries, ministry of each of the EU country, um, and ministries of several other countries which uh, we have received um, um, messages from the students, asking them, could you at least tell us what's the number of students from Bosnia and Herzegovina in this particular case who study in your country? And we have received this information. It was like a small campaign, like uh, two or three weeks um, long. Um, until this moment, we have, we have received uh, information and collected the statistical data that there is more than six 1,400 Bosnian students studying abroad as full degree students. Um, and, and this is only data from 30 countries. Additionally, if we add to those students, those Bosnians who live already um, abroad with their parents, but do, who do have a Bosnian citizenship, um, this number is almost 10,000 students. Um, and we have gladly sent all the data um, to Bosnian ministries, um, to the Council of Ministers, and they have promised last month already, um, Ministry of Civil Affairs has promised that they will try to push uh, to ask uh, for funds from the, from, the, from the state institutions. However, parallel with that, we did not want just to wait for, for, for um, the help of, of um, our authorities. Um, we also reached out to our diaspora to Bosnian diaspora, um, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Belgium, um, in USA. Um, and parallel with that, we have also sent another inquiry, another um, Google Forms, if, if you wish, to all those students, those 6,400 of them, and ask them, please submit here um, your data if you are under really serious financial situation, meaning that you have a hardship paying rent paying for food, et cetera. Um, 
And through that, through that call, we have received on around 250 uh, uh, student names. And with the help of um, diaspora, uh, Balkans diaspora, not just Bosnian diaspora, that's very uh, important to underline. Um, we have managed to finance around 200 of those of those young people who have really had hard time paying the rent, paying for food, um, etc. So this is something that I think um, we need to understand when it comes to um, those young people who are faced with difficulties. They are not just those who are living currently in the Western Balkans. They're also Western Balkan citizens, students studying abroad. And this is very important notion because um, the way how our governments, Western Balkan governments, treat and have been treating um, their own citizens, young people studying abroad, tells a lot, even regardless of the COVID. Um, until now, we have understood that that Western Balkan governments, in 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 a large proportion, do not appreciate and do not prioritize um, the value and the prospects of young people studying abroad. Uh, they often do not understand the, um, the the great deal of 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 responsibility that they do have towards them because a large amount a overwhelming majority of those young people that we have been in contact with um have left us comments in the in the in the google forms saying that they would love that they have they are studying abroad with the aim to return back to their homeland so this is something um that we have to understand and that, that we have to grasp that those young people studying abroad are a huge resource um, for our um, government. And not just those young people who study abroad, also our diaspora, um, who, is, who, who has been living abroad for, for the last 20, 25, 30 years, even longer, um, is, is a huge resource um, for, for um, our government. Um, when it comes back to Germany, it's very interesting to say that uh, German students um, have announced that they will go out to protests on 20th of June, so in four days. There will be a huge protest of um, German students who lost their jobs, who demand from Germany, from, their, from the government um, itself to help, not just German students, but also students who study in Germany. Uh, there is also a great example from Slovenia and Slovenian universities who have um, um, uh, offered to send a financial help to all students, uh, foreign students who study in Germany, in, sorry, in Slovenia. Germany as well has offered uh, to send 500 euros for the three months um, to um, all the students who have lost their, their jobs. According to students, that's not enough. Um, they expect even more from, from, from the German government and they will voice their concerns um, in four days in, in, in Berlin. Uh, and then just to finish with that, I don't want to say, I don't want to paint the whole picture black. It's not. There was also, we had a really positive feedback for se from several Bosnian embassies um, and ambassadors um, in, in six EU countries uh, who have reached out directly um, to uh, students studying um, in the countries where they serve as ambassadors, um, sending them, um, in some cases, money as well, but more often sending them um, food, um, hygienic supplies, um, etc. And I and I think that is also the way the way and the blueprint um, for other diplomats um, um, of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, of the Western Balkans as well. But first and foremost. Um, in the moment that we recognize a, 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 a huge potential of young people studying abroad have uh, for a region, I think um, our governments will also, in that same moment, improve um, the relationship um, between them and um, our young people studying, working abroad, um, and, and, and connecting us with the outer world. I think I will stop here. Thanks. Um. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Samir, for the last one. And thank you all so much for bringing these interesting perspectives that usually do not really get covered by, by the media or actually receive the, the attention they deserve. Uh, we have some questions that I, I will read to you. And in case anybody has some other questions, feel free to, to write them down and we will uh, also go over them. 
Um, okay, so um, I have I see some questions who would like to be <laughs> addressed by with some panelists. So um, the first one will be about um, MF negotiations and uh, post uh, that are postponed to September uh, to the conference on the future of Europe and our Western Balkans somehow accounted for the for their in terms of. Um, representations or at least in uh, negotiations of the policies and I think Adnan would like to answer this question and also of course if you um, any of you want to answer you can uh, do so as well. Well thank you Anya very much. Uh, when it comes to the multi-annual financial framework uh, the European Commission has already announced a big package what they consider to be a big enormous uh, package for, for of, of, uh, financial support uh, for for the Western Western Balkans, and uh, of course, as someone who 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 is able to compare the figures with figures that the EU member states like Romania or Croatia will be getting in that period, I cannot but be uh, disappointed uh, with 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 the figure. But what is the the issue here, and same goes for the conference on on the future of Europe, is the lack of initiative from the Western Balkans. Uh, authorities, governments, and leaders. If you think about the uh, Future of Europe conference, I've only noticed civil society members wanting to be part of the conference on the future of Europe. I think that the reason for that is also because civil society feels that they have something to contribute to the discussion. I have a sense that most of our political leaders do not have uh, maybe not capacity or maybe not self-esteem or maybe maybe not uh, interest uh, to contribute to 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 such uh, to such a debate and it shows to a certain extent also how uh, how self obsessed we are in in the region and how we think that uh, we should actually not be part of these debates that we don't have interests that we need to represent in these debates that are happening in the EU and that in the end we don't have much to contribute. And that is also then results with uh, all the pessimism that is on the side of the EU, be it political leaders or observers or, 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 uh, or other, other people who, are, who feel oppose, opposition towards enlargement towards the Western Balkans because they ask what's the Western Balkans uh, contribution. Same goes with the MFF. I think that if the commission says it's a big going to contribute a lot and if uh, the political leaders accept it as such then we will end up with with what what the commission and the the eu will will uh, will award us with without any vision or without any any bigger vision for for the western balkans and and for the individual countries and what what needs to be uh, achieved in that respect and that uh, yes also to the first question that that stephanie said and a bit of continuation to what samir has has, has spoken about I think that uh, part of the problem in in our region, for example, this issue of our foreign ministry or any institution in Bosnia not knowing how many foreign students, how many our students are are studying abroad, is the lack of of, of need or expectation. So we as a society, as members of societies, have very uh, little expectations from our uh, from our governments and from our authorities. I often hear from businesses or from young people or from 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 people living in 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 our countries uh, telling me that their biggest expectation from the government is not to have anything to do with the government. So their biggest dream is that the government just leaves them alone and that they can they can live live their life. And uh, in that sense, I think that what brings us together and what what motivates me is my expectation from our countries and from our authorities and from our governments to actually do more, deliver more, and be better in in in, in what they what they should be should be doing or what or uh, what uh, they are doing. And uh, additional motivation, of course, I find from examples when when things are working and uh, when things uh, when things are done uh, properly or when things are actually. Uh, actually, actually changed. So yeah, that would be kind of the answer to to the two questions and a bit of a of a reflection on what Samir has said. Um, in case um, any of the, the two of you do not want to comment on this one, uh, we can go um, to the next question. Um, so the next question is. 
how is the cooperation with civil society organizations on a regional level in the context of lobbying for EU support when it comes to the implementation of European values, democracy and, and human rights? And I think Dafina would like to answer this one. And again, if anyone wants to comment as well, feel free. Um, well, yeah, thank you for the question. The idea is that um, Inter-regional cooperation has to be exercised and has to be systematically exercised in order to send, let's say, uh, joint key messages towards European Union level. If we do not find the common language uh, among us, it would be very dif different than to go as, a, I don't know, if I can say it, as a squad, as a, as a team. Uh, when it comes to several um, issues and concerns that we do have uh, in order to improve, I don't know, our, uh, our frame of working, our, um, to strengthening the, the civil society of Western Balkans, to strengthening the, the organizations which do work here, to be more, more realistic in the programs and the projects we do implement. One of the things that, for example, we have faced, um, and this is based on a study done in Kosovo, Montenegro, and uh, Albania about the uh, civil society organizations uh, towards implementing the EU values or talking about EU values or implementing those projects which bring us near the EU uh, frame, the, the obstacles that we do face is the fact that the narratives uh, are not local narratives. The uh, topics which are tweeted are not coming as a bottom-up approach, but are somehow artificially brought back to the, the grassroots level, to the local level. So we need to have a better reflection of our situation in order to get the proper injection. So if, if we are not designing our, the campaigns, if we are not designing our work, our activities, our projects, in the, properly to the needs of, of uh, the NGO sector, of the civil society, of the youth sector here, then in the end, what is going to be uh, delivered, what is going to be as an outcome is going to be maybe good, maybe very nice uh, in the public opinion, but not real. So one of the things we should address is the fact that, yes, we should exercise more this inter-regional cooperation, inter-society um, uh, cooperation in the region, but on the other hand, we should stick about upon our requests, our situation, um, what we really need from the EU, the way ourselves as civil society, and the fact that we need a lot of support to um, exercise the dialogue within the countries, within the region. Because if we are not solving our issues in our, um, in our local reality, it is impossible to use the regional scale to address uh, them properly. Uh, it was mentioned before the fact that civil society participates in different forums, it, it participates in different EU conferences. And we have, I, I mean, I've been myself part of different conferences when, uh, when I, didn't, I didn't see the representatives of the government or people coming from the, from the state level. And what does this mean? It means that firstly, they are missing what is going on in, in European scale or in regional scale. Secondly, they are missing the opportunity to show what they are doing in that matter. And thirdly, they are missing to listen properly to the opinions of the people who are, let's say, um, those which um, do need uh, the proper answering, the proper reaction from the governments, the, the civil society, those people which in the end of the day are electing these political elites. So they are missing all these important things and they cannot be surprised when we are in situations, uh, deadlock situations. So. What I, uh, what I would say is the fact that um, the cooperation among our, our countries has been much more intensified during the Berlin process. It helped a lot to have systematic meetings, to have uh, joint approaches towards important issues and, and uh, important policies that have been developed. What was missing during that process maybe is the financial backbone or proper strategy or a proper frame. But I think that we need a, a frame to operate jointly. If you leave it in the hands or in the goodwill of the countries itself, it can happen, but I think we risk too much. What I think it's a proper, it's needed to design a proper frame, a proper policy package, or, or uh, I don't know, uh, 
a strategy which strengthens the dialogue within the countries, within the region and region EU. So an extension of the Berlin process, a Berlin plus process, or at least a process which makes sure that all the actors are in there, not forgetting uh, the MPs, not forgetting the uh, representatives in local uh, municipal councils, not forgetting media, uh, not forgetting uh, state representatives, uh, public administration, not keeping it only in the civil society level and circulating the communication, the projects, the ideas, the activities among the same circle, because it's not going to um, to have a proper delivery, a proper product. We should start to work in a kind of cross-sectorial approach and involve all the actors uh, when it comes to the regional dynamics and regional EU relations. Your mic is muted, Danya. I'm sorry, I, I pressed it, but I didn't really work. Um, if we don't have any additional questions, but I, th I think that some have already been answered, um, I guess we can uh, kind of conclude this this discussion because I don't see any additional questions. Uh, before we conclude, I would uh, like to also wrap it up. Um, I would also like to thank to to our panelists and to to organizers. And one, some things that we have learned uh, through this panel discussion is that we really have different perspectives coming from top-down level and, and bottom-up uh, bottom, uh, level, and they kind of need to meet somewhere in between, and we lack this, this dialogue between, between the levels. We do have different, different perspectives from these, but this initiative and, and cooperation usually uh, comes from young people, comes from civil society organizations, from um, different think tanks in the region, being through different initiatives, being through student exchanges or student mobility. But what we need to do uh, as young people, as um, NGOs, as think, think tanks, is actually to bring this voice and bring this perspective to, to a, a higher level, to the politics level, and actually have it reflected um, in a cooperation between our governments and something that will kind of fast, fasten the, the process and actually uh, bring the, the, the bigger change. Um, I would also once again like to thank to uh, Interna International Institute for Peace and Austrian Institute for International Affairs and Karl Renner Institute for actually giving us the platform and giving us young people of, of different uh, civil society organizations the, the, the voice and the platform to state what has been on, on our mind, what has been our reality and what um, has been something that we have jointly been working on. So uh, once again, I would like to, to thank you for, for being here today with us as uh, attendees and also as panelists. And hopefully uh, we will see each other uh, on a, on, in a new uh, event. Thank you so much. Bye.